you guys. So these are extra ones I'm making now because I realised I didn't make enough videos. Um, so this is one is kind of about suffering. Um, we've kind of touched on these subjects, the violence one and um, uh, it was not last week's one, it's the one I sent out last week, but exile, um, you know, what it, what it means to be human, what does it mean to be Christian and how does suffering and the idea of our theology of suffering and our theology of victory in life, how do those kind of work out as being human? Um, I haven't got my notes on the screen this time, so I'm going to be looking at a piece of paper, but I just think this is a really, as charismatics, I love our positivity, I love our victory, I love our hope, I love that we strive to see the more on earth. Like, I love that. I'll always be charismatic. I go to a charismatic theology college, you know, that, that is an advocate for that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm also mindful that, you know, sometimes we can tip the balance and go too far. And um, my issue is that oh, I believe the Bible, um, I talked about in Ephesians, that the Bible is quite clear that it is the kingdom of God is the now. So we see it now, but it's the not yet. So whilst Jesus conquered the grave, um, 2,000 years ago, whilst he paid the price for everything 2,000 years ago, the point is not that we have everything now, okay? So um, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I just what I want to talk about is I just kind of want to, um, I want to talk about like where suffering, like what do we do about suffering? I'm not saying like, oh, does God call suffering? I'm not talking about that. Um, I'm talking about like, the assumption that we should suffer as Christians. And um, that's my position that that that's a, th a thesis or whatever, or my argument is as Christians, we will and we should suffer if we say we're followers of Christ and follow who he is and what he did. OK, so I haven't done introductions. That's not very helpful, um, but I just want to go over. Um, so we had the early church and for those who know um of you know the early church the persecution was rife um uh, we know that constantine in the fourth century early fourth century um made it legal to be christian and it wasn't actually it wasn't just about being christian it was actually about being free to um follow any god that you wanted so um, but anyway, that's a side note. But before that, before he came, before he came a Christian, it was empire wide. It was the Roman Empire that ruled the lands and it was empire wide persecution. But before that, it was not empire. It was more localized persecution. So if you lived in certain areas like uh, Nero, if you probably heard of Nero and um, he was in Rome, obviously. And he so there's terrific. Uh, persecution in Rome but it wasn't an empire-wide thing it was in localized areas um so we have in the early church <coughs> localized areas called Carthage Carthage um there's some early church fathers that come out of this place um but I just want to tell you a story about two women I don't think I've talked about this in other videos but there's two women and um and this woman called Perpetua wrote a, a diary you might have heard of it you might have read it I've got it if you want to read it it's not very long um, and it's called The Passion of the Holy Martyrs, Perpetua and Felicitas. Um, it was basically, yeah, a diary documentary, documented. And this is uh, Perpetua did the diary. Obviously, when she was being martyred, someone else took it on. She gave it to someone to do, to finish, to complete. Um, but it's just about their imprisonment, these two women, Perpetua and Felicitas, their imprisonment and their subsequent execution. And this was in 203 AD, and this is Carthage. So people... Um, being persecuted in this area, which is uh, modern day Tunisia, North Africa. Um, so the women were arrested. Um, I won't go into it like detail, I'm just going to like skip over it. But the women were basically arrested, questioned, and eventually sent to their deaths. And they were maimed by wild beasts. And then, because the wild beasts didn't kill them, they were then slain by the sword. Um, and it was a gladiatorial games um, for the area. And it was to celebrate the emperor's son. So go figure, like that's, that's your entertainment. That's to celebrate your son's birthday. Um, and Perpetua was actually from a noble family uh, and she had a young baby boy. Um, I can't remember how old he was, not young, uh, quite young. Um, and so she was, he was pre weaned, so he was still being fully breastfed. Um, and so she was breastfeeding. And Felicitas was a slave woman 
obviously connected in some way to Perpetua and who was heavily pregnant at a time of imprisonment, like saving grace in some ways that the Roman army wouldn't kill pregnant women, heavily pregnant women. However, they're quite happy to kill him afterwards, which is basically a death sentence to a baby, potentially, if they haven't got anyone to, to breastfeed them. But anyway, um, so their demise and ultimate destruction came at the hands of refusing to take an oath burn make a sacrifice or burn incense to honor the emperor and the roman gods that is why they were killed they could be christian they were allowed to be christian uh, but they had to also burn incense or make a sacrifice for the roman gods so you had to do both and because they refused and were unwilling to compromise their christian values as, as, as their values as christian women um, Perpetua gave up her pre wean child to someone, and we actually know in the diary that uh, he um, he was okay. Um, uh, and Felicitas, um, they all prayed because she wanted to go to her death with all the other people, martyrs, including Perpetua, and she knew she wouldn't be able to because she was still she was eight months pregnant. So they prayed in this diary you hear about them praying to go into early labour so she could give birth, hand over the baby, and go to her death with the others. And that's exactly what happens. It says they prayed, and as soon as they stopped praying, an hour later she went into she had labour pains and she went into birth, being mocked and scorned by the Roman guards because obviously she was making you know noises because any woman, amen, it hurts when you get birth. And I'm assuming a in a in a cell with no painkillers or anything was probably quite traumatic. Um, mocking her and scorning her, saying you know how are you going to survive? You know the, the the gladiatorial games if you can't you know be quiet when you're giving birth. I guess. But she gives the baby up to a sister, a sister, um, uh, obviously a fellow believer. And um, they go to the Perpetua, Felicitas and the other martyrs go to their deaths and this goes to all the games. Um, just to say, like, you know, that wasn't uncommon for um, the Christians to be so close, like, um, to look after other people's children. Basically, back in the, oh, I'm going on a bit of a detail here, but um, back in the day, um, Roman this very patriarchal a woman would have a baby and then show it to the patriarch, the father, and he could make a decision whether she could keep it or whether she had to get rid of it. Don't ask. I, I'm not quite sure why. Um, why? But and and early Christians used to go outside the gates of the cities and pick up the babies that had been thrown over the walls. So just to say that Christians from day one have always been pro life. Have always have always understood. Well, intrinsically, we understand that we every life has purpose and made in the image of God, but also to have compassion and actually um, look after those babies. So anyway, that's a side note. But um, yeah, so what they wouldn't do, they wouldn't worship other gods, um, the gods at the time and why people didn't like them. So there's obviously this idea of localised um, politicians and stuff thinking, you know, they're going to, they, these people are going to uprise, they're going to try, because they didn't understand Christianity. It was a new thing. Um, but also the, the local people had fear that, you know, if these Christians, if these people um, didn't uh, sacrifice to the gods, then if there's droughts or earthquakes or, you know, bad crops, then it's because these people aren't being served, subservient to the gods because that's how the gods always live. The gods, our idea of a loving God and a personal God is just just so out of their understanding. And, you know, you serve the gods, you know, that you are subservient to them and, and you just are at the mercy of whether they volatile, volatility. So um, yeah, so they could so basically they could blame they would lay blame the Christians and the, the, their fear their fear of nature and the fear of the gods would want them to get rid of these Christians because they're not sacrificing to the gods and if the gods are going to send droughts you know because they're angry at these people are not going to do it so basically the Christians were scapegoats um, back then so they were the, they were the scapegoats. And they suffered just as Jesus did. And we know that Jesus was the scapegoat of the world. Now, the imagery of scapegoat is in the Old Testament. It's got to do with Yom Kippur, got to do with the Day of Atonement, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, yeah, with the scapegoat, the two goats, um, for the people's sins. Um, oh, have I put it here? So the persecuted church would be martyred and persecuted just as Jesus was martyred, martyred and persecuted. And they were, so they were following in the footsteps of Christ. They understood that to be Christian 
was to follow Christ and to follow Christ was to suffer and potentially and and potentially to die. So when Jesus says, you know, pick up your cross, you know, the disciples knew where they had littered streets were littered with crosses that they literally he was literally saying this is you, you, you pick up your cross you know literally you will you may have to die for me um yeah so and and paul talks about this a lot in the in his in his writings so in the idea of baptism it actually says you know the idea of like we die with christ we rise with christ christ um and we have new life in christ but to be like Christ and to look like Christ and to follow Christ, um, then we must suffer like Christ. And but Jesus suffered, Jesus Christ suffered with the joy set before him. We know scripture says that. And so the joy set before him was what was his joy? His joy was us. Is us that Jesus incarnate himself into humanity, he came into being, you know, human with us. He condescended himself into humanity. And what he did was unified us restored us back to um to god uh and so this is our joy um so he went to the cross because god so loves his creation and he went to the cross with joy knowing his people could be rescued and saved that's what he was doing that was his joy um so now we can deny ourselves and carry our cross of suffering to love those who god died for so christ did it for us for all of us and then he says you go do it now for others so this is what Jesus asks of all his true disciples. So what's our abundance that aligns up with, you know, coming alongside suffering? Because, again, you can have parts of the church or people talk about it's just suffering, suffering, suffering. We've just got to suffer and crawl on our hands and knees till we get to heaven. Um, OK, yeah, I mean, some people do that. You know, that is a reality for some people. Um, however, the the joy is ultimately being restored back to god and there is a relationship there like again like we're not we don't have the, we're not muslims you know our god is not just great and good and out there and separate from ourselves god has brought himself into humanity through christ so we are you know connected with him we'll never be god but we are in union with christ in god, back to god and restored through christ by the power of the spirit so, um, uh, so, so since the garden, so that's all we know, everything went belly up. Um, we know there's been some kind of separation and there is still some kind of separation. So Paul talks in Ephesians about the reconciliation between us and God through Christ by the power of the spirit. And that we, we are under, or we were, if we're Christians, were under the cosmic powers that we could never rid ourselves of. Oh, hello. It's turned upside down. Um, ourselves. After Christ came um, and when we accept Christ, um, Tony's sacrifice for us, and we are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Um, but the, the conversation doesn't end there, obviously. Uh, we don't go straight to heaven. So um, obviously there is assignment that God wants us to do that we, um, we are here on earth. We're, we're humans. We have an assignment on earth. We look at Genesis 1 and 2. Um, otherwise, you know, we would, yeah, we'd just go straight to heaven. But that's not the point. Um, we uh, So when we became Christian, in the same way, we are also not given a perfect life on earth. Um, once we, well, yeah, once we become Christian, you know, we don't have a perfect life. That's not the point. The point is not to have a perfect life. Otherwise, if it was, then we would go straight to heaven. God has restored us back to himself, but we are also being restored and we will be perfectly restored but not in this lifetime. This is what we're talking about, the kingdom of God, the now and the not yet. Always think about the idea of the kingdom. You see things now. We see heaven, we use different language. We see heaven break through. We see, you know, but we also recognise that there's, there's hell on earth. And also the reality is we have an assignment on earth that we won't have an assignment in heaven. You don't get married. There's no marriage in heaven. Um, yeah, so uh, where was I? So we won't be perfectly restored in this lifetime, um, but we have to have a healthy idea of what it means to be human on earth. Um, and that includes our whole being, our whole being human, human being, you know, so it's mind, body, soul. They're all interconnected and the one is not greater than the other. They're all interconnected and, and they will all affect one another as well. So 
We recognise that when Jesus came, he used the whole being of a person to show the restoration of God to his creation. So he opened blind eyes, he healed deaf ears, and he raised people from the dead. Um, this is physical connecting with the spiritual. They're interconnected. So we see people healed of diseases. It's symbolic, but it's also literal of the restoration. Um, however, physical healings are not the main point. Jesus raised people from the dead, but those people still eventually died. Um, and people still healed are raised from the dead, and they still carry on, go on to die. Um, some people just want to see Jesus and the, and the apostles healing as purely symbolic, um, as just an example, and that's probably get that with cessationists they're just saying or the close of canon it was symbolic that's what god wants to do restore us back to himself it's a spiritual dynamic just yeah which is not really the point um but that's our modern day culture a lot of christianity separates the spiritual with the physical so when we say for example blessed are the poor jesus says blessed are the poor it's not just a financial issue it's a full-blown body mind spiritual poverty it's recognizing the whole of our humanity is um uh yeah i heard someone a while back say be a good jew or ancient person and don't separate the physical with the spiritual i like that be a good jew um so but it is true that physical healing aren't the main point it's not the main point we are still going to die our bodies are still crumbling because we live in a fallen world um restoration back to god that is the main point um but physical healings represent something of the spiritual in the physical um, it it brings God into our you know into into where we are. So our abundance is pursuing repentance for ourselves and others. It is in the restoration to be made in human likeness, which is truly human. To be truly human is only possible through Christ and His incarnation into humanity and what He did that um, on the cross as a human and as God and subsequent resurrection. The heart of the kingdom of God is Jesus is lord jesus is god and only through him can we be restored from god the kingdom so it's just this recognizing this physical spiritual reality but like i said to someone recently it's like would will you still love jesus if he never heals anyone again every time you pray no one's ever healed will you still love jesus or is your love for god um based on the fact that he does stuff on earth now he will do stuff that's the thing he does do stuff but i'm just trying to like be challenging but um because ultimately it's about jesus being lord coming to do what he did on the cross and us being connected back to the father but you know the, the physical um we all have resurrected bodies so the whole perfection is coming you know just and and we see glimmers of it that's the point but we won't see it all now so submit to his ways that is the way of salvation so if we go in Paul's example, we could argue that Paul, in his willingness, um, he in his willingness and humility, Paul, you know, Paul, um, emptied himself of all his privileges he had of a Pharisee. So we know to follow Christ. So we know he's a Pharisee, and he talks about that, about you know, in a bit of length, going, I was the Ben, I was the tribe of Benjamin, I was the best of the best, you know, and he would have had a lot of privilege, and he chose to empty himself of his privilege whilst not rejecting his past so we don't want to do that we don't want to reject his jewishness but we but emptying of his privileges of being this person and to follow christ um and so we read that he's yeah basically he's following jesus's footsteps so if we read philippians 2 5 7 it says in your relationship to one another have the same mindset as christ jesus who being in the very nature of god did not consider equality with god something to be used to his own advantage Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a slave, being made in human likeness. It's a servant here, but I've used the word slave because I think this is my argument. Is It was Jesus who became a slave by coming into humanity. So to be human was to be a slave. And, and this is the example Paul conformed to by suffering and dying for Christ, just like Christ. Paul also became um, a slave born again in human likeness new creation that's 2 corinthians 5 17 it says um yeah uh, anyway yeah uh, so to be a follower of christ and to be truly human is to be a slave we know in romans 6 18 it says we are not slaves to sin anymore 
as we become Christians, we become truly human, but to be truly human, we are slaves to righteousness. We're just not slaves to sin. And we know, um, sorry, and to be truly human is to be a slave, and to be a slave is to suffer. So we either can suffer for sin and death and have eternal consequences, or we can suffer for righteousness sake. And that's what we're called to do as Christians if we say we follow Christ. <clears throat> uh, so Jesus suffered with the joy set before him. We know that the joy was uniting humanity back to God. And Paul suffered knowing what it was to be truly human. And so we now, because we read the Bible, we now that we, to be truly human is also to suffer. And we don't want a theology or not the concepts of how to live as the idea that Jesus suffered as a slave, you know, suffered, yeah, suffered as a slave, you know, so we don't have to. Like, we don't want to go down that line of thinking, okay? That's what I'm arguing against, that actually it's not the case that, oh, because Jesus suffered and died on the cross, that now we don't have to suffer, that he's just paid the price for everything, now we can have a great life, amen. That is not the point on this earth, not the now, uh, but in the in the not yet. Uh, so it's not true that that to be human, it's it's true to be human that we should suffer. Otherwise, we do not follow Christ into His death, and that's Romans six that we do follow Him into His death. And um, because if we don't do that, we don't participate. If we don't participate in the suffering of the cross, we are only through Christ represented and substituted for at the cross. We are not participating in the cross where scripture, if we're going to be honest and true to scripture, the, the scriptures are quite clear that we deny ourselves. We pick up our cross. We suffer for righteousness sake. You know that actually we are represented, that Christ represents humanity in the cross and he does substitute through his sinlessness our sins. But also he asks us to participate in that in that cross as well. And when we start saying things like, oh, Jesus paid the price for everything, so we don't have to, and we just have a great life, we are basically saying we do not have to um, participate in the cross. And that is not what Christ said. So to understand what Christ did on the cross of humanity, there has to be three points of address, what I just said. We need to be represented at the cross, substituted for our sin, and we also need to participate in the cross. And we need to be true to those biblical testimonies of the cross. Um so I hope this is making sense. So what I'm saying is we have to suffer for Christ to be truly human, because to be truly human actually is to be a slave. And we either have a choice in humanity, we sit Jesus Christ and have the power of the spirit in us, we are slave to righteousness, or we stay under the cosmic powers of uh, the rulers of the air and we are a slave and we suffer for sin. So suffering is a part of being human. Suffering is a part of being a Christian because to be truly human is to be a Christian. Is to follow Christ, which will have you bumping up against the powers of the rule of the air, the cosmic powers that people are bound in with no way out apart from Christ, which is the will of the Father and made possible by the Holy Spirit. But the joy is the rest is in the restoration to God and the eternal promise we have in Christ, which is sealed in by the Holy Spirit. Um, but it is to suffer on this earth. So as a, the reason why I mentioned the persecuted church, they had and we have a persecuted church today. In some ways, it's a real obvious suffering. You know, they know if they speak the name of Jesus, they'll be persecuted, they'll, they'll die for their faith. So what I'm, uh, um, uh, so in our situation, we're a little bit like the post, like Constantine era, we're like the post persecuted church. You know, it's legal to be Christian, um, you know, and so we, and so you had people after that sort of, how do we suffer for Christ when people are okay with us? saying something you know about jesus or living our living a christian life or, or not having to go into the roman gods and give sacrifice and whatever um, and i suppose that's kind of a question that i'm leaving you guys um you know how can you suffer for your, for your faith today um uh so yeah i've made some comments in the pre yeah previous video so regarding the exile video like our values are they things that are going to hit against us culture there's some values in our culture that are great and like you can go and feed in soup kitchens every day of the week you can go and you know adopt hundreds of you know babies you can there's tons of stuff especially when it comes to social justice which is totally biblical and we totally should be doing that in in in, in the in the um sorry in the church we must be doing that 
but it won't get you persecuted in our society. Now, there's other societies that, you know, will, again, not necessarily persecute you, but think you're crazy. Like, why would you waste your life, you know, looking after the poor? You know, we don't really think like that. You know, so there's definitely been, you know, we've had 2,000 years of Christianity, and there's definitely things that um, resonate in our society that make it very Christian. Um, the problem is there's a lot of stuff nowadays that is is becoming less and less. Um, so, so compassion, we do have compassion to a, to a certain extent. Humility is becoming less so. Forgiveness, true, true love, what it means to be true love, uh, charity, perseverance, patience. Um, but ultimately, it's the uncompromising message of the gospel, which is, an, which is quite offensive in our age. So, you know, do people believe that they are intrinsic, intrinsically bad? There's something intrinsically wrong with them and broken and corrupt in them. And I would suggest more and more nowadays with this self-care and this self-love and this, you know, affirmations, I would say no. I think people think, well, there's something wrong, but if I just keep affirming myself, if I keep speaking truths over myself, if I keep self-caring and doing this for myself, then, you know, eventually, you know, I'm going to feel better. And the ultimate truth is that's just not true. Yes, there is something about, you know, God loves his humanity, but there's also something totally corrupt that he can't accept us, you know, without Christ. So, and that's the offensive message um, that people need some saving, which is something from outside themselves. And that's the gospel of Jesus. Um, and, you know, in the Bible, it says like to the Gentiles, you know, wisdom is it's folly and to the Jews, it's um can't remember what it says oh anyway but just you know it, 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 it it's about this wisdom like true wisdom is actually foolish to the world <clears throat> um so i just ask yourself yeah so you know have you ever been hated by family or friends because of what you believe or how you live um the truth of what you stand on the truth of you know what it means to be human and that that spoken about in other methods, you know, things that, you know, to be true, to, to be truly human is that every, every life has value, you know, from conception to death, like that's the truth, that's what the gospel, that's the message. And when you denounce that, then you denounce kind of what Jesus came to save, you know, because you're saying actually that, that doesn't need saving because we've deemed that not, we can, you know, kill that or we can, you know, do horrendous things to that, we can, enslave that person whatever because actually then they they don't have value and jesus said no i come to save the world i came to save everyone because everyone has intrinsic value but there is something totally corrupt and evil in you and i'm the only way that's going to get that out i'm going to save you from yourself um so you know so yeah so what is you get you know you get suffer from what you think of outside the church your family and also inside the church you know <clears throat> how does suffering work within the confines of the church where we've, we've got community we've got you know people that are all different to each other that we all intrinsically bound by the holy spirit but we are different um you know how do we deal with that you know we have we come from you know paul says you know there's there's no jew or gentile you know barbarian or um uh, someone <laughs> Um, male or female you know slave or free you know in other words people are coming from different places you know and how do we come together as a melting pot and say what well, we're all one in christ but we've also got to live this very practical life uh, of looking after each other caring for each other um you know what does that look like when we also still we're saints and sinners again another thing don't gosh you know the times i hear you know it's like oh we're we're not sinners anymore. Don't declare that over you. Like, of course you're sinners. Oh my gosh, you sin every day. Like, and I think the longer you become a Christian, the more humble you should become and realize how sinful you are. But God still loves you, and we have Jesus' righteousness, and we should also we will become we will be more restored through this life, sanctified through this life. But uh yeah, but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't mean you'll be perfect and to not recognize you're not a sinner anymore you're going to get yourself in a world of trouble because you're just going to think everything you do is perfectly fine because oh god's in me so anything i do is perfectly fine oh my gosh no please do not go down that road like you have to suffer um because righteousness sake to be a better person sometimes you know 
Um, uh, yeah, and also recognising you're a sinner for the rest of your life. Until you, yeah, until you meet Jesus, he comes again. So just meditate on that. Sorry, I have waffled a bit on this one. Um, but just meditate on Philippians 2 scripture that gave above about um, human likeness and being a slave and what you emptying yourself of, of privileges and rights to become a follower of Christ. Because Jesus gave up yeah, his glory, he came from heaven, consented himself into humanity. What, you know, what, what are we giving up, what are you giving up to um, suffer for Christ? Because we're not going to be killed for our faith, but you know, this idea that we, we are supposed to suffer. So if we're not suffering, there's probably something wrong. Okay, sorry, that's 30 minutes. I hope that was okay. If you've got any questions, yeah, message me. All right.